This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Finally, in E3, we look at ethics, we look at corporate social responsibility, and we look very briefly at corporate governance. Much of what we looked at in strategic management can have an ethical component. Uh, deciding to close a factory in one area of the country and open it somewhere else uh, has got consequences for the employees who may be losing their jobs. How much testing to do on a new product before you feel it's safe to uh, market it to individuals. Uh, how you uh, control and keep and collect data is something which is becoming of increasing ethical uh, concern and consideration. So ethics is going to be important uh, and it's going to be an important consideration for many of the decisions which are made uh, when devising a strategic plan and putting it into operation. Ethics is uh, essentially the study of right and wrong, of moral and immoral behaviour, uh, but also what's acceptable and what's non-acceptable, uh, because I think we realise that uh, what might be uh, regarded as wrong in certain environments, in certain countries perhaps, uh, is a, a, a course of action which is not really going to raise concern in another country. Uh, and different people, different cultures, different countries have maybe their own views of right and wrong, moral and immoral, immoral, acceptable and non-acceptable. Uh, but what's important, I think, uh, here uh, is that for a particular company or a particular organization in whatever environment it's operating in, that its behavior is regarded as being acceptable. Now, we don't have to uh, appeal uh, particularly to the moral aspects of ethics to conclude that ethics are nevertheless uh, important uh, because bad ethics will inevitably cost money and therefore we can justify an ethical stance and ethical considerations uh, on the basis of profit maximization. And really lying behind that is the, the idea that if you act in an immoral or unethical way, the chances are you're going to be caught. And the chances have greatly increased, uh, really, with uh, modern technology. Uh, it's uh, very easy now to uh, copy and send maybe a, a confidential file, a confidential uh, letter uh, via email. Vast amount of data can very quickly be uh, transferred, for example, by uh, whistleblowers. Uh, the uh, internet and blogs and Twitter and Instagram and so on, all of the social media uh, are very quickly to recognize what they regard as unethical behavior uh, and can quickly uh, you know, make this kind of go viral, even though uh, perhaps on more considered uh, uh, thought, more careful thought, it's maybe not regarded as being that unacceptable at all, or there are arguments and so on. So companies nowadays are, are treading very, very carefully, uh, and it's essentially to do with a, a reputation. Uh, bad ethics uh, will lead to a bad uh, reputation, a lowering of goodwill, uh, and a bad reputation, a damage to the brand perhaps, is going to cause uh, damage to the bottom line. If you uh, follow good ethical principles, your reputation will be enhanced, uh, but also the uh, chance of there being uh, financial damage is much lower. Uh, we all know that uh, companies from time to time, uh, by bad luck almost, uh, do things uh, incorrectly. Uh, but if it's shown that it took reasonable care, uh, uh, they may have to pay damages, uh, but it, it will not be the punitive damages that might be levied if it was thought that they were uh, covering up uh, some problem with the, the product or some event which they want to keep secret. 
There could be regulatory uh, penalties. Uh, they could uh, lose their license to trade. Uh, uh, can also uh, uh, come in as well. Uh, the authorities simply say, right, you, you, you keep messing things up and you keep breaking the law or, or damaging people. We're simply going to remove your, your license to market pharmaceuticals. It also means, of course, that if uh, you are discovered as being unethical, people worry about what other nasties are waiting to be still discovered, what skeletons are there in the cupboard. Uh, and this makes uh, investors nervous. They perceive this is a, a company with risk. It has a track record of uh, having to pay damages and not testing uh, products, products properly. And they kind of say, well, it's probably going to happen again. And you know, if we're going to invest in this company, we want to get a better return. So the financial damages, punitive damages, loss and right of trade, loss of customers, all increases uh, the perceived risk and increased perceived risk leads to increased cost of finance. There is a relationship between the cost of finance, the dividends that people expect or the interest that banks expect and the risk. The higher the risk, the higher return people want to compensate for that risk. So risky companies uh, will find it quite difficult to raise finance at a reasonable cost. If you can uh, find cheaper finance, uh, then that is going to, for example, lower your discount rate, it's going to lower your interest rates and so on. It will make uh, projects uh, have larger Net present values, it may turn negative NPV projects into positive ones. Uh, it will enhance, enhance the returns uh, which are enjoyed by shareholders. Also, it's worth saying that if you have a bad reputation, you know, who wants to be associated with that? If you want to enter into a joint venture, maybe to uh, embark on some large project, you don't want to take all the risk on yourself or all the finance on yourself. You having to find a, a, a collaborator, a form a strategic alliance, and you have a bad reputation, you're going to find it hard to find partners. <clears throat> Similarly, good recruits, good graduates, good employees. Why would they want to be employed by a company which is a, a bad reputation? Everyone would prefer to be employed uh, by a company in which they can in a way, take some pride uh, and, and almost not be ashamed to tell their friends that they're employed there. There are four possible ethical stances that companies can adopt. In other words, almost how good should they be? Uh, the first one, short-term shareholder interests, isn't much of an ethical stance at all. This is saying we want to increase short-term profit as much as possible. And the way they might increase short-term profit is not training staff, cutting corners on uh, safety testing, cutting corners in training and development, cutting, cutting corners on the quality of the product. Uh, you may get the profits up for a year, but then of course all, all this kind of unethical treatment uh, comes home to roost. Uh, and no one will want to buy these uh, shoddy or dangerous program uh, uh, products from you again. Longer-term shareholder interest gets a little better. Uh, here to uh, keep you, the profits going for a number of years, you have to have a reputation. You must do nothing to hurt that reputation. Uh, and therefore, uh, focusing on longer-term profits almost in inevitably uh, forces people to take a longer term view uh, of how their reputation will be preserved. We then move from looking after just shareholders to, in the third stance, looking after stakeholders, multiple stakeholder obligations. In other words, the company uh, says that we must not just be ethical towards shareholders maximize their profits, but we have to be ethical towards other stakeholders. So we have to be fair to suppliers, we have to pay them promptly. We have to be fair and ethical towards competitors, we mustn't embark on industrial espionage. 
we must be fair to the people living locally, uh, not to pollute the air, the water, uh, not to destroy the roads, the roads by having heavy traffic, not to have noise pollution and, and, and the like. Uh, so there we have a multiple stakeholder obligations, recognizing that we have ethical obligations towards not just if what you might call the very connected or internal stakeholders, but almost every stakeholder around. And finally, we have what's called a shaper of society. Uh, this is where the company wants to actually really change the long-term outlook of society uh, to try to shift uh, the way acceptable behavior is actually perceived. One of the first companies to uh, really embark on this uh, is a company called Body Shop. It was uh, started off by uh, someone who believed very passionately uh, on, for example, recycling containers. I mean, most of the most of the products were sold in kind of, or many of them, kind of plastic bottles, and they were very keen that you would recycle those, bring them back uh, to be reused. Uh, they were very keen if they bought um, plants, for example, uh, for extracts. Uh, if there's, these were being bought, let's say, from you know the Amazonian jungle or wherever this plant was uh, growing, uh, that they would give the producers or collectors of these items fair prices, uh, rather than trying to exploit them. So they were. They also said we will not test any of these products on animals. Uh, so they were taking a, a much tougher ethical or moral stance than many, than many competing suppliers of what you might call cosmetics were doing. And and very soon you found that other cosmetic manufacturers were following, because it was discovered that the ethical stance taken by Body Shop was popular amongst consumers. Uh, I mean, it, it might be a, a response which is a bit cynical, uh, but at least the body shop kind of showed the way, and other companies found themselves obliged to follow uh, and change their attitudes towards recycling, animal testing, uh, fair trade uh, with producers. Corporate social responsibility. Uh, corporate social responsibility can be uh, described as the extent to which an organization will exceed its minimum obligations to stakeholders and society at large. So the first thing we have to do is, is obviously to uh, comply with the law. So a company could comply with the law on health and safety, could co comply with the law on maximum working weeks, it could comply with the law on minimum wage rates, but corporate social responsibility would say, actually, I think I should go a little bit further. Although I could employ people at the minimum wage, I would be more comfortable at employing them at what they might call the, you know, a living wage or, or something of that type. Uh, although they say I could make a product which will last and be safe for five years, I could actually make it last for 10 years. Another definition is the acceptance by uh, companies or organizations that they should be accountable uh, not only for their financial performance, but also for the impact that their activities have on society and the environment. Uh, corporate social responsibility implies that there's an expectation that the business will act in the public interest. Again, going further than the normal legal obligations uh, that might be imposed. So to show corporate social responsibility, uh, some companies will give each member of staff, you know, a day off per month uh, to go and work uh, at maybe a charity for free. Or the company will make some sort of, you know, 10% donation towards uh, again, a particular charity or a particular hospital, something in their area. Or maybe what the, cost, the, the company will do, uh, it will have a deliberate policy of recruiting uh, people 
who perhaps have been in prison, uh, who are finding it difficult to get jobs in, in other ways, and therefore the danger is, of course, they revert to crime, uh, and they recruit people who have had some sort of criminal record, and they give them training, and they give them a fresh start. There is no legal obligation on any of these companies to do any of these things, but the company decides to do it. Quite obviously, if a company does this, uh, it uh, can and will receive good publicity. If you sponsor the local sports team and you have the name of a company emblazoned on the, the backs, backs of their uh, T-shirts, then of course it's giving you good publicity. And, and anything which gives the company good publicity, good PR, it's no different than just paying money on advertising. It's a different form of promotion. I think where certain aspects of corporate social responsibility can r run into a little bit of uh, trouble is, is how the directors decide where the money should be spent and how much should be spent. Uh, there is a legal obligation on directors to act on behalf of the shareholders. That is the legal reality. And of course, the directors could say that, you know, that giving this donation to the local hospital will help PR, will help our reputation. Ultimately, that will help profits in the shareholders. That's fine. But what happens if, say, the board of directors suddenly starts saying, well, the profit is one million. I will give half of that to the local hospital. A couple of problems. First, I think they ought to uh, get shareholders' permission for that, because it is really shareholders' money, ultimately speaking. And the second problem, why have they chosen the local hospital? Why have they not you know, chosen uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature? Why have they not chosen Oxfam? Uh, why have they chosen that particular good cause? Uh, is it just because that's what the directors think it should be? Is there any democratic connection, so to speak, uh, between where the money's going and where the shareholders would actually like it to go. Some people say that maybe what you should do is to keep the money, give bigger dividends, and then if shareholders are feeling generous, then the shareholders can decide, I will give some of this dividend to a good cause, a charity which I support. Or maybe instead of giving the money to a charity, you keep it, uh, maybe your tax bill is a little bit higher then, and the government collects more money. And then, of course, the government has got a, a kind of e a democratic mandate, if you like, uh, for spending this sort of public money. But corporate social responsibility, taking more care about greenhouse gases, pollution, uh, carbon footprints, uh, making sure we're not uh, cheating producers of uh, products, paying your suppliers promptly. All of this feeds into a kind of ethical, uh, reputational area. Uh, and as I said, with the advent of social media, companies have to be perceived to be playing fair and, where possible, playing generously.